Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the WS YouTube channel. And this is part of some really awesome stuff. This is the education series. And I am very happy to have Daniel Peluso with us today. Hey, Dan. Hey, how's it going? I am doing very awesome on this 27th of January, 2023. Um, I'm in Phoenix, and we actually got below freezing this morning. So it's that time of year in Phoenix where it's very cold in the morning, but then in the afternoon, it's a fairly comfortable 50 plus, 60 plus, something like that. So very well. And I hope to get out for a bike ride today. So it'll be a good afternoon. Nice. To get out, so. um, and how about you? Where are you located at, Dan? Uh, so right now I'm in uh, San Francisco, California, and... Uh, it was a uh, chilly 40 degrees. Um, <laughs> I'm originally from the East Coast, so I'm, I'm familiar with like actual cold we weather. But then you living in California, or as I'm sure you're familiar with where you're at, you get used to the, the warmer cold. Yeah, the warmer. And that becomes your new cold. <laughs> yeah. Unless you spend a summer in San Francisco. I think Mark Twain had a line about that or something. So. <laughs> yeah, no, there's been some days in San Francisco where I've, it's been, I, I live in Vallejo, which is north, north kind of North okay. Bay. Mm -hmm. And uh, it'd be super hot, 90 degrees in Vallejo, and then come into San Francisco and you need a winter coat. Absolutely. Yeah, when that fog rolls in, it's yay. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Um, and Dan, what do you like to do in education? Well, uh, so I uh, was a former high school physics teacher. Cool. And I uh, was always interested in getting my PhD. And um, kind of gave up on the idea a little bit because I was older and didn't want to move around and um, just right. kind of wanted to, you know, uh, enjoy the, the, the new home that uh, my uh, wife and I built uh, here in California. Cool. And I was fortunate to serendipitously meet this uh, astronomy educator by the name of Carl Pennypacker. And yeah, he, sure. um, mm -hmm. you've met Carl before? By oh, name. Nice. Never yeah. met him, but I know him by name. Um, so he, he's, uh, for those of that don't know, he's a, uh, semi-retired astrophysicist with, uh, Lawrence Berkeley national labs. And he's done a lot of work in astronomy education over the past 30 years. Mm -hmm. And he just so happened to be the person who helped, uh, lead the astronomy club at the high school that, that I taught at in, in Vallejo. Nice. So, uh, him and I met and, you know, I told him how I loved, you know, astronomy and I wanted to get my PhD and I wanted it to kind of combine, um, astrophysics and astronomy education, you know, but I wasn't really sure anywhere that I could do that. And I didn't want to move around. And he said, well, guess what, Dan, it's your lucky day. And I, uh, am a researcher with the university of Southern Queensland. Uh, he, he works on this cool project, uh, that has to do with, uh, wild, wildfire prevention. Okay. So they use, they use, uh, cameras and some of the same techniques that Carl, uh, helped develop for, uh, supernovas. Okay. Um, and, you know, expanding universe, which is kind of interesting that, you know, we can use telescopes to figure out, you know, the cosmos, but we can use those same techniques to look back down on earth to help ourselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, anyways, uh, that, that led to me working mm -hmm. on a uh, PhD that, uh, I'm almost, uh, completing. I should be finishing it later this year. Yeah. And, um, it's a combination of astronomy education and astrophysics. And my, uh, my goals and my inspiration, uh, or my inspiration for it, which led to my goals, was to uh, find a way to do science education better, nice. to, you know, motivate and inspire students and teachers, too, and to give them uh, an opportunity to um, learn science by actually being involved in, in doing it. Very cool. Well, I look... Um... <clears throat> I look forward to calling you Dr. Peluso here in Olpad. So congratulations on almost. Oh, thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll milk it for, for at least a month and then, <laughs> then I'll let it go. Is that kind of the traditional <laughs> path people do? Uh, some shorter, some longer, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, very cool. Very good. Um, so yeah, you must be in uh, thesis mode at this point, yeah? Yeah, well, I, I'm really fortunate that uh, you know, Australia has... A, a, you know, a graduate school model. It's very similar to some European countries where I'm doing a, a thesis by publication. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. um, I have to uh, have two first author papers published in a, you know, a top journal. And then my third one can be in manuscript form. And then, you know, yeah. I submit, submit that with introduction and conclusion, you know, yep. Yep. text here and there. And that becomes what I, what I submit for my PhD. Yep. Yep. 
Very good. Yeah. I have a grad student doing that right now. Yeah. She's in that same stage. Oh, um, nice. Very cool. Um, so let's go ahead and dig in a little bit on, on uh, you know, what are some of the topics in those uh, uh, astronomy education um, uh, articles that you have? What are some of maybe the external activities that you got going? I notice you have a nice little unistellar um, scope there over your shoulder. Um, how does that play in? And let's go. Yeah, so uh, to bring a little bit more serendipity into the past few years of my life, whenever I was uh, working uh, with uh, Carl on developing my you know thesis plan at the beginning stages of uh, entering my PhD, um, since I'm doing this uh, PhD in Australia, but doing uh, everything in the Bay Area, we're able to actually develop uh, and and put together a supervisor group that included uh, uh, people in Australia at the University of University of Southern Queensland, but then also a few people here in the Bay Area that have specialty in some of the areas that we wanted to focus on. So uh, I got an email uh, around the time that I was starting my PhD, and it was from the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers Association, and yeah. uh, as a as an astronomy lover and uh, you know science teacher, I was you know on their their email list, and uh, I got this email about uh, this talk that really excited me. And the talk was called "The Search for the Next Pale Blue Dot." Okay. And uh, by a SETI Institute planetary astronomer by the name of, of Franck Marchis, and um, I didn't know who Franck Marchis was at the time, but I was really excited about the title because I'm a huge Carl Sagan fan. That's what got me into astronomy. And uh, yeah, <laughs> um, ditto. And nice, yeah, yeah. We a lot of us, uh, or thanks to to Carl Sagan, and I think. Um, but uh, but I I was excited about this, and I and the idea that he worked with uh, exoplanets and some of the other things that he worked with, and I uh, I said to Carl, I was like, well, how about how about this person? And he's like, well, go go to his talk and and you know ask him if he wants to be on our supervisor group. And I was like, no, I don't want to bother him. He's like, no, just go. And he's like, okay. So I did. And I watched his talk and it was very, you know, it was very exciting and inspiring. And he had this, uh, an early form of this telescope that he mentioned okay. um, that he was, that he was demoing after his talk. And I never heard of it before. I didn't know what it was. And I was standing in line with everyone else to go look through the telescope. Um, and you know, I, when I got up to talk to him, I was like, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm Dan and, you know, I want to do this PhD and I want to include, you know, education in it and, and he was excited about some of my ideas and he said, well, let's talk. And then I sort of, and then I find out that this telescope uh, is this new type of digital smart telescope. It's called the Unistellar Enhanced Vision Telescope. Hmm. And um, it, uh, he, he was one of the co-developers of it. And uh, cool. through the SETI Institute, right. he, um, he, he and uh, the telescope company Unistellar created an MOU, a uh, memorandum of understanding between the SETI Institute and Unistellar okay. uh, to create a, uh, this citizen science network using a telescope. Nice. And uh, Bronk had these visions of this telescope could be used in education. And he was looking for someone, you know, hoping that for someone to like help him build this education thing. And I was like, well, this is like kind of a perfect meeting. I'm glad I came to meet you. Right. So it, it turned into I've been using this telescope and the citizen science network associated with it for a lot of the research that I've been doing for my PhD. Cool. Um, so, so again, it's serendipity, right? Um, yeah. You know, it's, I think a lesson to anybody if, you know, it's just to put yourself out there, right? You know, you, you know, you put yourself out there, you talk to people and you network and never be, be afraid to ask. And, you know, you'll never know what's going to happen next and the cool things that, that can transpire from that. Great message. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so what, I don't know, what is it? So it's a digital, it's a digital telescope and it's got a, it's got a camera at its prime focus and it's got, um, you know, uh, a digital sensor that allows it to collect data from, um, astronomical objects. It's also really easy to use. It's controlled with a smartphone. Uh, oh, it's, nice. you know, it takes all, it takes all the, like, you know, the technical hard work out of, you know, doing basic ob observing, um, exactly. <laughs> Where is this thing? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I had, uh, I mean, I did some star parties, uh, whenever, before I knew about this when I was, you know, teaching, teaching high school science. And, you know, we, we had, I think I had an, a, a camping trip I did with students once and I borrowed a Dobsonian 
okay. from the mm -hmm. the San Francisco uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. Amateur Astronomer Association I mentioned. And, you know, it took me like an hour to set it up. <laughs> and kids were like, what's oh. going on? Why is it taking so long? And kids That's would leave, dog. right? <laughs> yeah. I know, right? And then I, and I never set one up before. So it was, you oh, know, wow. it was like super stressful. Right. And, and then, but then we finally got it set up and it was like, finally got it pointed at Jupiter and it was, you know, it was amazing when we did it, but it, you know, it took all night just to get that one, one image for someone that was, you know, an experience with this kind of thing. Um, but, you know, it, it, I just remember kids faces, you know, these kids have never, you know, seen something like this and they were amazed. Right. Um, and with this, it's, it's, you know, it's quick and you can get set up and observe in like under five minutes. Nice. And uh, it's, you know, it's made mainly for deep space objects, which is really exciting. So you can look at galaxies and nebulae and mm. you know, star clusters. But the exciting part and where it comes into uh, my, my research is that uh, we can, you know, collect uh, data on it for uh, the citizen science events. So we do this for asteroids. Um, so okay. culting asteroids, that's where uh, for those that don't know, that's where we have a background star and an asteroid passes in front of it and we get a little dip in light over time. And that can allow us to know um, some interesting things about an asteroid that we might want to study. Then there's planetary defense, so looking at near Earth objects. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, trying to make sure we don't get hit by one of them one day. And uh, we have comets. So we, we try to look at the uh, you know, the evolution of comets and then exoplanets. So there's planets around oh, other yeah. stars. Radio blast. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So these, uh, you know, bigger gas giant exoplanets, uh, we can uh, detect those with this instrument. And that's more of what I focus on is the exoplanets. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Um, uh, within that, has there been any new discoveries of what were unknown transit exoplanets? Um, are these follow-ups on uh, suspected <laughs> um, transits, or what is? So what we've mainly we've mainly been doing it for for follow-ups. So okay. this is actually a big problem yeah. in uh, astronomy and in all sciences. You know, like big data, right? So we have all this data, and you know, how do we you know keep track of it and process it all? And particularly with with exoplanets, what's really important is uh, what's at least for a certain type of exoplanet observation, is the transit light curve. Um, so um, maybe you could pull one of those up, actually. So there, there's one that is called POI 2031. Um, so uh, TOI, that's just the catalog number um, mm -hmm. based off a spacecraft uh, yes. called the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, you can see here that we have on the left and right side uh, kind of a baseline at one. So that's our baseline or no transit. But then we have this dip in the middle. Yep. And that dip, uh, you know, could mean in uh, a lot of cases that a planet is transiting in front of its star. So just like that occulting asteroid that I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. when we look at a distant star and we collect the energy from it, those photons of light that flux energy over time, if we see that that energy dips ever so slightly over a certain period of time. And that could mean that we have a transiting exoplanet. Imagine like a spotlight with a, you know, a fly flying, you know, through oh, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Yes. So these are really important for, for exoplanet uh, observations and understand, we can understand their uh, orbital period, how long it takes for them to orbit their star, how big the planet is based off the depth of right. that, that, uh, that transit light curve that we see here. Mm -hmm. And this was one that was done by uh, two citizen scientists fr from the Unistellar Network, um, one named uh, Bruno in France and the other uh, Justice in the United States. And uh, this is a, an important uh, test exoplanet that um, needs follow-up to help refine its orbit. And the cool thing about this, this particular observation is this particular exoplanet transit, uh, the first half of it was observable in Europe but not the second half, because we have we're, we live on this the spinning ball called Earth, yeah. and um, it yes. seems to move, <laughs> and that causes uh, you know the stars to kind of come out of our um, observation window over time. Right. So this was a really exciting uh, mm -hmm. result because we were able to have the citizen scientists located in two different um, geographic locations observe this exoplanet transit. Nice. And uh, they did this uh, 
yeah. uh, kind of all on their own accord. They they plan this on their own. So okay. we, we've had this network where where you know we we train them and we we you know teach them how to do this and we get targets for them and we suggest targets, but they've become organic where they talk to each other yes. uh, on our Slack channel and and yeah. they mm -hmm. uh, you know they they plan their own observations. This is one of them. This is actually going to be in a paper. Um, that uh, I authored that's going to be published uh, soon and the uh, publications of the Astronomical Society of the Pacific should come out in the next month or two, I think. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. How many people are in the um, in this network of observers? Is it tens, hundreds, thousands? So the um, the last estimate that I heard as far as how many telescopes, uh, these unistellar okay. EV scopes are located around the world is, is over 10,000. Um, but Whoa. as far as how... Yeah, but as how as far how how many of those people that have the telescopes are actually uh, using them for citizen mm -hmm. science is, is a much smaller number. And um, to give you kind of a scale for exoplanets specifically, okay. uh, the the paper that I just mentioned is kind of an overview of this exoplanet citizen science network. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a uh, 163 citizen science co-authors that okay. provided data over the mm -hmm. course of uh, I guess about about uh, a little over two years is about the amount of time that uh, I selected as the window uh, that I did this uh, um, overview paper on. Cool. Um, and these are people all over the world and they included um, just citizen scientists, uh, you know, your, your regular people, astronomy enthusiasts, these, uh, you know, include mm -hmm. people in the Northern and Southern Hemisphere and it included teachers and students that were involved in the observations. Very nice. Very mm -hmm. nice. Okay, cool. We'll have to get a hold of that paper. Check that out. Very nice. Yeah, but to um, I guess to put a put a cap on what your question was is is we have uh, you know thousands of confirmed exoplanets now. You know from you know there's there's ground based ones that have you know ground based observations that have found them, but then we have these space telescopes like Kepler and now TESS, and uh, they've you know found many thousands that are confirmed, and we have to confirm them. We have to follow up with, yes. you know, uh, making sure that they're actually what we think they are, right? Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, also um, there are many, many thousands that haven't been confirmed yet. So uh, networks, citizen science networks can help to do this because there's only so many professional astronomers and professional observatories. And, you know, as you know, the, the time on these are hard to get. They're hard and to we, get. Can't, we can't look at thousands of, uh, you know, targets uh, to, to confirm them. But then we also have this problem too with the uh, ephemeris. So like with the timing. So in that transit light curve, there's a, it's called this mid transit time, which is really important. Right. So that, <clears throat> excuse me. And when we want to find it, yeah, I got something in my throat. All good. Um, yes. Coffee. Coffee. Cheers. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, so if we ever want to find something, right, we need a lo you know, location and a time, right? If I want to meet, yes. you know, meet you for a coffee, we need to say, you when, know, fifth, yeah. fifth Street in Maine at, you know, 10 a.m., right? So if I wanted yeah. to find this exoplanet, you know, I need to know my coordinates and the time. Yeah. And if that time isn't right, then I'm not going to catch that important yeah. event of the exoplanet. Miss your um, yeah. And there's there's a group in uh, NASA called Exoplanet Watch. Yes. And um, you've heard of you've heard of them then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's exciting. They're involving citizen scientists to do these follow up observations of exoplanets that need refinement on their their timing, so that we can keep those times fresh. Because if there's an important target that we want to look at in a very expensive space telescope like JWST, then we want to make sure that timing's right. And citizen scientists around the world can contribute to that. And we figure, why not? Let's get teachers and students active and active in this, so that they can learn by doing in this exciting field. And also contribute to science and doing real science. Nice. Um, what is a what is a like that unit stellar scope you have there? What is that? What does that run to to get? Is that a few hundred thousand? A uh, few, few thousand. So they mm -hmm. they they if you go to Unistellar's website, you can Google that and you can find it. Um, they have uh, two models: uh, a lower cost model and then the more more expensive model. Um, and they range from between like two and four or five thousand dollars off the top yeah. of my head. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um yeah, but... so now that you've uh so you're still teaching high school. 
Gotcha. No, no. So I'm not, I'm not teaching high school right now. Okay. I, uh, so I'm, I'm full-time into my PhD, Got but it. then I also have a, uh, a part-time job uh, working for the SETI Institute. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's some grants that are helping with a program that I help run uh, called the Unistellar College Astronomy Network, where mm -hmm. uh, we, we have this grant from the uh, 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 Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, where mm -hmm. we've placed these telescopes into uh, just about 30 community colleges in the mm -hmm. United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, me and a colleague I work with, Tom Esposito, uh, him and I work on training these uh, teachers how to use the telescope and encouraging them to do citizen science observations with their students and their astronomy 101 classes. And then we also run workshops to try to help them to learn how to teach in a more inquiry-based and inspiring way with uh, using the instrument and the data they collect from it. Cool. Can can people apply to this program, or can other how do, how would uh, teachers engage this? Yeah. So um, we we're always you know accepting applications. You know, it's all kind of limited to like funding, right? Resources. Um, yes, I get that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. So if if anyone is interested listening to this, then I would say just uh, you know send send me an email, and um, I can share. You know, you could share my email on the. Uh, you know, the, you know, YouTube, you know, channel description or, or yeah, whatever yeah, ways yeah, works yeah, best. And, yep. and I think that blog article, um, oh, I can link to that as well. Yes. Yeah. The blog article from AES, I think has a link to our SETI Institute okay. page, uh, that talks about the UCAN network. And, um, there's, I think there's a link to, to message me and, uh, Tom about that if you're interested. Okay, good, good. Mm -hmm. Cause we like to get this, um, technology and experience and network out out to as many educators as we can handle resource wise so no very, thanks very good yeah and if uh, if you're if you have uh, a lot of grant money you're wanting to give out you know we could also accept those emails too <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> just oodles of it just hanging out I know, waiting, right? waiting for something to do with it <laughs> uh if only if only <clears throat> uh, well, maybe if you're LIGO or something like that, I don't know. Mm -hmm. ah, throwing darts. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But you, I mean, you asked about teaching though. So yeah, <laughs> so I'm not, te I'm not teaching right now, uh, high school, but I am teaching, um, a, a graduate level course through the American modeling teachers association. Oh. Uh, so that this is another part of my research, uh, you know, to try to have more inquiry based, uh, activities and how we do science education is called modeling instruction. Okay. And this is something that was developed in the 80s and 90s by a uh, pretty well-known physicist, David Hestinus. Okay. And and okay. David Hestinus worked with uh, a high school science teacher, and they developed this method okay. using whiteboards in class where students work in small groups. Mm -hmm. And uh, the teacher, no longer the sage on the stage, okay, um, but instead is in the background and kind of being a, you know, a, a maestro and helping the students to discover um, the uh, knowledge that they want them to learn through their own work. So as an example, you know, there'll be some sort of phenomenon that's shown to the students that gets them excited. The students will actually collect data and then they'll work in groups and they'll develop a model because models are really important in science. And then they'll get up um, and uh, each group will present their, their whiteboards that they worked on as a group. Nice. And they'll say, this is our model that we created based off the data. And then the other group will say, this is our model. And this is the data we collected and what we think and so on and so forth. And then the goal in this is for the students to engage in this discourse and to, you know, right. argue in an academic way of whose model is the best. And then go back to the drawing board and, mm -hmm. and collect more data and refine your model until we get to the yeah. model that we want. Yes. Right. Yes. It's a very constructivist type of way of learning. And it's been shown to be. Uh, one of the most effective ways to to learn uh, and one of the most effective ways to learn science and physics. In fact, there's a lot of colleges and universities that use the modeling method when teaching physics because they find it's more effective than your directed instruction approach. Um, so so how, this, is, how is that different than, let's say, you know, the, the term these days is flipped classroom, right? So um, they sound very similar. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, I think flipped classroom, um, you know, can sometimes be perceived as um, you know, students um, doing kind of their own self-directed learning on, uh, you know, they watch the videos and stuff, you know, 
like, you know, and, uh, and then they come back and the teacher doesn't have to like lecture on that. Right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the fl flip classroom is, this could be, you know, d depending on like how some educators might want to define what a flip classroom is. Um, you, I, you might bucket it into that in some way, mm -hmm. but at least, yeah, but at least in my, from how I understand it, which could, could be wrong, um, is, okay. is it's more, it's more students are, are trying to watch videos to learn something on their own instead of watching a lecture on it. Like I'm going to watch this video on, you know, Newton's second law on YouTube or whatever, wherever Khan Academy, mm -hmm. you know, and then that was replacing the teacher from having to, to teach mm -hmm. it to you. Yeah, right. And that could work for some very dedicated, you know, students, yes. um, but especially students in lower socioeconomic areas and, um, you know, students that are, you know, usually not as engaged in the typical, typical type of classroom doesn't work so much. Right. right. And we, we find uh, there's actually a lot of research that, you know, has been shown for, you know, for a while that, um, you know, project based learning initiatives where you're actually involved in a project, you're getting your hands dirty and you're actually involved right. in, in something. This is more effective and motivating for students, uh, especially students that do come from, you know, uh, very, you know, different and um, diverse backgrounds and needs. Good, good, very nice, very cool. Yeah, but the course is running now through AMT and it's, it's called Astronomy Modeling with Exoplanets. And uh, so this is for teachers, this mm -hmm. is a course for teachers. So, you know, uh, we, our teachers are so important in so many different ways. And unfortunately in our society, we, we don't value them as much as we should. Right. And, um, you know, if you teach, change one teacher's uh, way that they teach and you inspire them and motivate them and give them the skills that then disseminates, right. you know, to, to many hundreds and hundreds, you know, thousands of students over many years. Right. So there, there used to be programs funded through the National Science Foundation, NSF, to give teacher preparation courses um, mm. to teachers to help them to teach better mm. in science. Yeah. That doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, which is I don't recall. I pretty, yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty sad. Um, but we can change this. <clears throat> you know, sad things are meant to give change. us a feel so that we can change, right? Absolutely. Um, but uh, but it, and it's exciting. We have uh, we have a, a full roster for this course, and we have teachers actually all over the world. Most of them are in America, but we have uh, uh, teachers in uh, South America and one uh, one teacher um, in the Middle East that is uh, getting up at three in the morning to take our course, which is pretty, wow. it's pretty that's, cool. That's impressive. Yeah. Dedication. <laughs> very, yeah. very nice. Well, we'll put a link to that in the description below the video as well. Uh, once you graduate and you, you uh, pad that around for a month or so, whatever it may be, um, do you anticipate uh, teaching in high school again? Yeah, I, I do want to teach. I'm not really sure. And, like what capacity, but I, I don't want to, I don't think I want to teach at the college level. Um, that doesn't mean if, uh, if you're at a university or college, and you want to hire me, you can still uh, call me. Um, so, <laughs> so please let me know. Yes. Um, but I, I do want to be in the classroom in, in yes. some form or, or way. And I think, you know, the, the, the best place that you can make a difference is as younger students. And a lot of research shows yeah. that, right. Yeah. I mean, we, we need great teachers in all levels. But, um, you know, I'd be really interested in, you know, trying teaching, you know, middle school, you know, for, for a little bit, which is really hard because I've had middle schoolers before. Uh, yes. Middle school teachers deserve a medal of honor <laughs> for, for the work that they do. Um, but uh, my ideal situation would be able to be teaching like one course, but then also continuing like research and like uh, these like outreach programs and you know, getting grants to help teachers and, on. and to, you know, yep. change how we teach science. That's kind of the, the bright eyed goal. Very cool. Very cool. And this is a, this is a something that, um, that is, you know, changing how we teach science and including astronomy. Uh, I found really, you'll find this interesting. I think your viewers will find this too. It's something that, that dates back like over a hundred years, the reason why we don't have astronomy. Have you heard of the committee of 10? No. Okay, so it already sounds kind of ominous, right? The Committee of yeah. Ten, right? Um, but uh, in 18th and 19th century, astronomy was actually very common in primary and secondary school curriculum. It was actually required in most secondary curriculum. Uh, right. People knew astronomy. In fact, teachers um, were taught astronomy in their preparation courses. Okay. What happened? Right? Yeah, I don't know so, what happened there. Yeah. 
in 18, 1892, uh, this Harvard, uh, these, this Harvard uh, professor um, was concerned with inconsistent preparatory for college. So mm-hmm. they, they developed the Committee of Ten. And they met in uh, early uh, 1890s, and they decided basically that, you know, physics, chemistry, and biology were going to be the main courses uh, for, you know, college admissions, not astronomy. There was no astronomy person on this committee. And then you saw immediate decline in yeah. astronomy being used um, in high school curriculum. They just decided that it wasn't important. And then you have, you know, all this development, you know, and, you know, our discovering of the expanding universe and, um, you know, uh, this exoplanets and all kinds of things that happen that are just not, you know, uh, given to, to uh, education, you know, after that time. And mm-hmm. there's been re- more recent studies that shows that there's like 17%, uh, only 17% of the whole world um, schools curriculum have any type of astronomy option at all. So mm-hmm. that means that most students around the world um, don't have the option of actually getting inspired by the cosmos. And from my own personal experience and other teachers I ask, and there has been some research on this, kids get excited about space and they want to talk about it. And we don't give them this excitement. <laughs> Not that so, excitement. Yeah. Okay. So we got a work cut out for us. <laughs> we do. We can do it though. We can do it. Astronomy in every curricula at middle school on up. But right. even, even in grade school, right? I mean, so I, you know, I've certainly been in plenty of grade schools, um, you know, doing a spiel and kids love it. But, you know, they get yeah, to, they do. They get to try on funny 3D glasses, they get to look at stuff, you know, it's very it's very exciting for them. Yeah. Just, I mean, I, I would say all all yeah. humans love it. I mean you know, look how, look how popular astrology is still, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so people mm-hmm. get inspired, you know, by, by the cosmos and, you know, especially young, young kids that they want to, they want to be wowed and amazed and dream and have, uh, you know, these, you know, amazing um, uh, experiences of, 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 of dreaming, right? Yeah. And there's so much of that in the universe that, you know, uh, there's so there's so much that we can, we can use this richness that can help inspire and motivate them. Right. All you need is one spark. You just need one spark from one person to light that fire. Um, That's right. Sagan in our case, for example. But mm-hmm. so, very cool. Very cool. Very nice. Okay. Um. Any final thoughts? Any final final words? Uh, well, I want to thank you again for for having me. It's been great talking to you, and uh, sure. you know, uh, just you know, say any teachers out there, thank you for you know what you're doing. Stick in there, Absolutely. and uh, if you're interested in teaching, we always need great teachers. And uh, you know, maybe uh, if you're listening to this, still thank a teacher. <laughs> very good. I like that. I, we're going to use that for the theme on this one. Thank the teacher. Nice. Very good. That's right. Well, soon, Doctor Peluso. Um, thank you very much for um, talking about your activities in education and your education research. I think it's, that's really novel. It's very nice. Thank you. It's been an honor. I appreciate you having me. Thank you. And that'll do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. See ya. <laughs>